Welcome everyone, thanks for tuning in. Um, my name is Michael Kearns, I'm on the computer science faculty at the University of Pennsylvania. And today I wanna to tell you about a line of recent work that we've been doing at Penn and other places as well, um, basically trying to find good definitions and algorithms that interpolate between group notions of fairness and individual notions of fairness in machine learning. Um, I'll tell you what I mean by these things if you're not familiar with them. And if you're wondering um, why this talk is in a game theory conference, I hope to make that very clear by, by the end. Okay, um, so just whirlwind tour of the burgeoning field of fairness research in machine learning, statistics, and related fields. To a crude first approximation, there are essentially two types of fairness definitions that have been considered in the literature. The vast majority of them are what you would call group fairness notions. So in these notions, you basically pre-identify what attributes or groups you would like to protect and what harm you would like to protect them from. So for instance, um, in a consumer lending application, we might think of the harm that can be caused to individuals as, as false rejections, sort of falsely denying a loan to somebody that would have repaid it. And so we might ask um, as a fairness notion, to make sure that no racial group, for instance, is suffering a false rejection rate that's much higher than another racial group. Okay, so we might want to equalize the false rejection rates. We might want to equalize the overall error rates, et cetera. And we might want to do this across, you know, not just race, but by gender, but by age and other demographic features. Um, the advantages of this type of definition are mainly twofold. They have very strong theory behind them and good algorithms, effective algorithms and practical implementations of these algorithms. So you can really not just analyze these definitions, but you can actually enforce them in practice and train models that obey these different definitions. Um, the, the, the weakness of them, of course, is sort of obvious is they make no promises to individuals whatsoever. They bind at the group level. So for instance, if you are a black loan applicant, who is falsely rejected for a loan, your consolation is supposed to be the knowledge that white loan applicants are being falsely rejected at a similar rate as your racial group. So um, this has not been lost on the research community. And so there have been a number of, of attempts to come up with definitions of fairness that, in, that can be enforced at the individual level, so that really make promises to you specifically. Um, and so um, examples include what's sometimes called metric fairness or, or fairness through awareness or meritocratic fairness, um, which, for instance, to give you a flavor of it, might posit some distance metric between individuals and ask that similar individuals, nearby individuals, should be treated similarly. So if you and I have similar loan applications, we should have similar probabilities of getting a loan. Um, and these definitions are nice, of course, because they have stronger semantics, um, but the strong, often non-statistical assumptions required have largely prevented practical implementations of these types of definitions. And so what we've been interested in for the past several years is about interpolations between these two types of definitions, things that on the one hand have the practical and algorithmic advantages of group fairness notions, well, coming at least closer, if perhaps not getting all the way to individual fairness guarantees, much more granular guarantees, if you like. And um, the broad approach that we and others have taken is what is sometimes called the Oracle efficient approach. Um, so what is the Oracle efficient approach? So the Oracle efficient approach is de not designed to address the conundrum that even without any kind of fairness constraints, from a theoretical perspective, machine learning is an intractable problem. So even the simplest kind of learning problem that you can imagine, I give you a bunch of points labeled plus, plus and minus in d-dimensional space, and I ask you to find the best linear separator, the, 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 the linear separator that minimizes the classification error. So even that you know, baby machine learning problem is NP hard already. Okay. Nevertheless, um, despite the fact that the learning theory literature is littered with negative or, or intractability results, miraculously, this has not prevented the advance of experimental machine learning, which probably everybody has not been a, a, able to avoid hearing about in the last 10 years with the tremendous successes of things like deep learning and neural networks and the like. 
And so the idea of the aura coefficient approach is to kind of piggyback on the fact that we know that at least in practice, um, real machine learning problems on often complex models can be solved by, you know, heuristics that may not be tractable in the worst case, but work surprisingly well in the typical case or in the real world cases. So the idea is to basically assume that we have a subroutine or what's sometimes called an oracle for solving standard machine learning problems without any fairness constraints, and then show that you can reduce the problem of learning with this or that fairness constraint to the non-fair problem. In other words, you basically write a meta algorithm that uses the non-fair subroutine um, to, to basically bootstrap up to meet the fairness conditions. And this approach was first proposed in a very nice paper from about 2016 um, from Microsoft Research. And um, sometimes, especially a theoretical computer science audience might ask like, well, you know, you know, if you know that some learning problem, some fairness constrained learning problem is NP hard, for example, why not just reduce to some generic nonlinear problem solver, like a general integer programming um, uh, solution? And the answer is that the, the reductions you get by this Oracle efficient approach are often much more direct and practical. In particular, they often only involve just re-weightings of the training data. Um, and, they, and this lets us leverage powerful machine learning heuristics and machinery. And so in some cases, this Oracle or subroutine might actually be efficient already, and then the overall algorithm would be efficient as well, linear regression perhaps being the most obvious case. And as I'm going to you know, show you briefly in the talk, this, the central tool behind these reductions or, or algorithms that you know, are bootstrapping on top of some non-fair learning subroutine is in fact game theory. Okay, so let me tell you what this agenda looks like um, in the abstract, and then I'll, I'll tell you about some sample applications of it. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're going to begin by expressing the training of a, of a model subject to fairness constraints um, as a linear or convex constrained optimization problem. So in other words, the basic problem we're gonna write down is gonna look something like minimize the classification error, for instance, subject to various fairness constraints. So concretely, I might say, find the neural network which minimizes the classification error subject to the error rates on these five racial groups being equal or approximately equal. And to do this, we are gonna to need to move from whatever our initial class of models was to mixture models so that we kind of convexify the problem. And we're gonna basically linearize or convexify um, these problems in a brute force way. We're actually going to essentially introduce a variable for the weight that we might put on absolutely any model in our model class and a weight for any for all of the possible fairness constraints that we might be concerned about. And in general, um, this means that the number of constraints and the number of models that we're entertaining might be exponentially large or even infinite. So obviously from an algorithmic standpoint, we want to avoid explicit enumeration, but as I'll describe, there are very good tricks for doing that. And so once we set it up as a constrained optimization problem over this kind of heinously large model space and constraint space, we're gonna use classic linear programming duality to pass to the Lagrangian and recast this as a two player zero sum game. And so it'll be helpful going forward to think of the primal player as the learner who generally wants to minimize the overall error of the model regardless of the fairness constraints and the dual player as a regulator who is there to enforce the fairness constraints and perhaps allowing some slack in the fairness constraints. So instead of asking that the you know, error rates between different racial groups be numerically identical, I might ask that they be within 1% of each other or 5% of each other. And of course, by relaxing the constraints, I give myself more wiggle room to optimize the objective and then we'll be able to kind of trace out a trade-off between the error and the fairness violations. Okay, and so I, I probably don't need to tell anybody in this meeting that once you pass to this two player zero sum game, um, the Nash equilibrium of this game is actually the solution to the original constrained optimization problem we wrote down. And so now we've kind of just traded one apparently difficult problem for another difficult problem, which is how do we lay our hands on 
the Nash equilibrium or an approximate equilibrium of this two player game in which both players may have an infinite or exponentially large action space, pure strategy space. And so it turns out that if you can, in a machine learning context now, if you can formulate the best responses of each player as an instance of what's called cost sensitive classification, and think of cost sensitive classification just as normal classification, I give you a data set that's labeled plus and minus, and you want to minimize the error, but I'm going to allow different weights on the different data points. I don't, it doesn't have to be the uniform distribution. And I might allow different costs for misclassifying in the two directions, right? It might, on some, in, on some instances in the data set, I might charge you more for making a mistake, um, a false positive than a false negative, for example. So if we can formulate best responses for the two players as cost sensitive classification problems, and by a classic result due to Freund and Shapiri, we can implement at least one of the two players as a no regret algorithm with respect to their strategy space. Then you have an algorithm that provably converges in polynomial time to an approximate equilibrium of the original game and therefore of your constrained optimization problem. Okay. Um, and the nice thing about this is if you can pull this agenda off, you immediately have an algorithm that you can go run experiments with, right? Because you can just for the cost sensitive classification oracle, you know, when we move outside of the theory where we're, we're assuming a perfect worst case oracle um, to practice, we can simply swap out that subroutine for, you know, your favorite, you know, heuristic for machine learning, maybe it's stochastic gradient descent on neural networks, for example. And you can try it and it doesn't have any guarantees, but you can definitely see if it works or not. And I'll show you some examples. So what I want to do now is just quickly give you um, a whirlwind tour of a few different applications of exactly this agenda. And I'm not going to get into the weeds on exactly how you do each of these steps, but that's the basic work. It's, you know, if you look at the, the steps on this slide, it's for each of these different types of fairness definitions that I'm going to give now, figuring out how to pull off this agenda, how to instantiate you know, um, best response as cost sensitive classification, figuring out which of the two players you can make into a no regret algorithm, et cetera. Okay. So let me first talk about um, um, a fairness definition um, that, that, you know, you might think of as being designed to prevent what we call fairness gerrymandering. So what do I mean by fairness gerrymandering? So Fairness gerrymandering is where you achieve some aggregate fairness definition um, in a marginal way um, without actually um, protecting fairness at the joint level. I see a hand raised. Is that, uh, yeah, go for it, Sergio. Yeah, can, can I just uh, clarify something? Uh, you said that you can have exponentially many constraints. Now, that means that the number of variables that you have is exponential in the original data, which means that you, your linear programming or whatever method you have is going to be polynomial, but polynomial in something that is already exponential in the original data. Not in the data, not in the data, right? So, so imagine a setting where there's, the, so the pure strategies of the learner or the, or the primal player are the models in your class, right? The neural networks in your parametric family, okay? And the pure strategies of the regulator are your fairness constraints. And I'm about to give an example where there would be a very large number of those, but we can come to that in a second, okay? Okay, so the question so, so is whether- so, yeah. so basically what happens, right, is in round one, the learner just says, I'm picking the neural network which minimizes the training error period. And then the regulator says, okay, um, that model has a false rejection rate on black people that is twice as high as on white people. And that violates one of the fairness constraints. You have to fix it. So basically the corresponding term now gets added to the Lagrangian. And now basically the learner re-optimizes, right? They're basically now going to be minimizing some mixture of the overall error and the disparity in the black and white false rejection rates, okay? All this I understand, but you said that the number of constraints can be arbitrarily large, which means that somebody has got to check something which is no longer polynomial in the data. If it's a, so the, okay, okay. So, so this is where okay, this, this this is where I'm assuming that we or have an oracle, oracle that, that which basically can, can identify 
okay. that can identify the most violated constraint. Okay, oh, so okay. there's a huge so number of them. Okay, but you but okay. you, you you can basically formulate the problem of identifying the most violated constraint as just another you know kind of problem on this data set. Okay. Okay. Uh, if you have such, such an oracle, then okay, that solves. Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. Thanks. Good. Um, okay. So fairness gerrymandering. So fairness gerrymandering. Let me let me speed up a little bit and skip to this slide. Um, uh, okay. By the way, fairness gerrymandering. After we kind of came up with this notion, it was pointed out to us that this is closely related to the feminist theory. Um, notion of intersectionality that was de developed back in the 1970s. Um, so there's nothing new under the sun, it turns out. Um, but, but so what's the idea of this stronger fairness definition? So the, what we're concerned about is that even if, for instance, I ask to be fair by race, by gender, by disability status, et cetera, Okay, so I could write down all these constraints, like you know the the false the false the error rate has to be the same across racial groups, gender groups, income groups, disability, etc. There is no guarantee that if I satisfy all of those fairness constraints, that I still won't end up discriminating, for example, against disabled Hispanic women over age fifty-five earning less than twenty-five thousand dollars annually because I only asked to enforce the fairness constraints marginally by each of those attributes. I didn't ask for combinations of them, okay? Um, so, so in this stronger notion of fairness that we're proposing, right? We propose that, you know, we actually identify some, you know, class of groups that might be combinatorially rich in nature, right? So for instance, all possible combinations of attributes like gender, race, income levels, disability status, sexual orientation, and the like, okay? Or even more generally, you could just give me some, you know, large class of group membership functions and basically say, I want the error rates to be the same across all of the groups in this class or approximately the same, okay? So when you do this, obviously, you're getting to a much more granular notion of fairness, okay? Because um, first of all, the groups are intersectional now. You could be a member of many of these groups simultaneously, okay? And, and they might be very, very large in number because they're not a partition of the input space anymore. They can, they can be overlapping, okay? And it's moving towards individual fairness because once I basically say like, well, I mean, if I, if I go far enough and I say like, well, I wanna be fair by race, by age, by gender, by hair color, by eye color, by height, by weight, et cetera. You know, at some point I basically have put each person in their own group. Now, of course we can't allow that because, you know, we're still in a statistical framework. So we need it to be the case that, you know we have a training data set and we're gonna do something on that training data set. And we wanna make sure that that generalizes out of sample. So we can't, for instance, hope to provide strong fairness protections for groups that are so small in the general population that they're not even represented in our data set at all. And that basically comes out in the way that one writes down the constraints, okay? So let me not, in the interest of time, try to slog through this, but, but basically th this is, you know, an objective of the type that I described to minimize some notion of error subject to group fairness constraints. And one of the terms of this group fairness constraint does involve the weight of the group, the basically the, the representation of the group in the data set or in the population. And the smaller, basically you can think of as the smaller the weight of a group in the population is, um, the, the weaker the fairness guarantees we'll be able to promise to them. Or alternatively, you can think of it as that you know, given the size of our data set, we're gonna basically say that we can provide fairly strong fairness protections for all groups that constitute, let's say at least 1% of the population, okay? Um, so just for, so, so, so you can write down this definition of, of kind of intersectional fairness where you have kind of arbitrarily rich group structures. And um, as Sergio pointed out, you know, if you assume that you have this Oracle, then the rest of the agenda that I described can be made to work, work out and you have a provable polynomial time algorithm over that assumption. But you can also, you know, you now at least have an algorithm that you can implement and you can actually go try on real data sets by just plugging in some standard ML heuristic for this assumed Oracle. And for fun, this is showing you a visualization 
um, of the actual execution of this algorithm on a data set where fairness is a concern. So when I start this animation, the X axis here is gonna be the overall error of the model. So smaller is better. And the, uh, the Y axis is gonna be the overall fair and unfairness of the model. So again, small, smaller is better. And the dashed line, which is actually at something like 0.005 or something, the dashed line basically indicates the upper bound on the fairness, uh, unfairness violation that we're allowing in the constrained optimization problem. Okay, so let me, let me start this um, little movie. Okay, so, you know, um, the action starts off with a model that has rather low error and high unfairness, as you would expect. And it goes on some crazy trajectory for a while. For a while, for instance, over here, both error and unfairness are getting worse, okay? But at some time, you see that this thing starts to converge and settling down and still moving here. The color coding indicates how many iterations the algorithm has been through. So things are moving very fast at the beginning. Now, very, very small steps are being taken. And you know, you know, what you would expect is that this thing is gonna converge to a point very close to the dotted line, right? Because that would mean that the fairness constraints are saturated, okay? And sort of a point near the dotted line as far to the left as possible. And now this is stopped and you can see that actually, you know, we ended up here and earlier in the trajectory, we actually explored a slightly better point over here. Right. This is this is sort of the best point that we touch in this movie. It's the point that it, you know obeys the fairness constraints. It's below this dashed line and it's furthest to the left. But you see, we ended up quite close to that. And in general, we find that you know there, while there are some tricks to the trade, and of course, like anything in machine learning, some tuning of hyperparameters is involved. You can actually make these algorithms work quite effectively in this kind of setting, um, and and in the other ones that I'll describe as well. Okay, um, oh no, I don't wanna do this again. I wanna go to the next slide. Um, on these plots, just pay attention to the red for simplicity. The other thing you can do, of course, with such an algorithm on real data is you can adjust the amount of fairness violation that you allow. You can basically say, I want the error rates across groups to be identical, or you can relax that to within 1% or within 5%. And of course, if you let it be within 100%, that's like not asking for any fairness at all. And you just have a straight up error minimization problem as usual in machine learning. But you can basically play with that parameter and try to trace out the Pareto frontier of models for any given data set. So for instance, if we look at this plot on the left here, again, we have error on the x-axis, unfairness on the y-axis, okay? And each little red dot here is a different model obtained by running an algorithm like the one I just visualized, but changing where that dashed line is, gradually, gradually um, lowering or raising that dashed line. So for instance, you, you, you know, here's one choice of model you have, this is basically the one where the fairness constraints are vacuous. So you have the smallest error on the x-axis, but the largest unfairness. At the other extreme, you can get to zero unfairness at the expense of much higher error. And in between, you have in between. And in general, what you want are curves that kind of look like this. In other words, they have a fair amount of convexity to them. Because this, when you have a highly convex curve, it means that, for instance, compared to this model, for only a slight increase in the error, you can actually reduce the unfairness a considerable amount, okay? Um, and this is in general what you want. Um, okay, and, you, and you'll see sometimes you get that, sometimes you don't. Um, here is a case where, you know, you face a pretty hard trade-off, you know, um, per unit of unfairness that you squeeze out, you get a corresponding, you know, additional unit of, of error. Okay, um, I've only got a couple of minutes left. So let me just quickly mention some other settings in which you can do interesting things. Let me just skip ahead there a little bit. Um, uh, another setting another setting that falls into the same algorithmic framework is what we call average individual fairness, where we imagine that we might, instead of making a single decision about you, 
like whether to give you a loan, we might be making a series of decisions about you over time. So, you know, um, usually e-commerce or advertising are the best examples. I might make many product recommendations to you on Amazon over time. Google might over time make many decisions about what ads to show you. We might, you know, label the same image with many different labels like people, indoors, ocean, things that are out outdoors, ocean, things like that. And once we do this, it's sensible to talk about not just the error rate across a population on a single problem, but the error rate for you across multiple problems, right? So if I've made a series of product recommendations to you and some of them were good and some of them were bad, we can talk about my error rate in making product recommendations to you in particular. And so now we can basically ask for individual fairness, but at this amor in this amortized way, I'm basically going to say like, you know, look, you know, Dirk and Sergio, um, I do not promise that I'm going to equalize your, you know, how you're treated on any one of these product recommendations, but I'm going to make sure that your, the error rate that my model gives for Dirk and for Sergio across many products is roughly the same. And so now I have something that binds at the individual level, but I can still talk about rates across different predictions that I'm making about you. And again, you can cast this in this same kind of game theoretic framework where you want to minimize the overall error of the model subject to all of these average individual fairness constraints. And here's again, a kind of a visualization of this algorithm in operation on a real data set. Just pay attention to the blue and red points here. So basically, um, again, on the x-axis, I have error rate. On the y-axis here, I basically have unfairness, like how great the variation in individual error rates is across problems. And you can see that when I, you know, when I ask for very relaxed fairness constraints, I get the lowest error here. This is the, this is kind of the average overall error of the population is the red point. The blue points are the individual error rate. So, you know, this might be Dirk and this might be Sergio way over here. And so I'm treating them wildly differently, but I'm getting the lowest error rate. As I tighten the, the bound that I allow on this variance across individual error rates, um, I indeed, like I tighten this blue cloud. So now down here, everybody's smushed together. Everybody's within 0.04 of each other on their individual, uh, their average, fair, average individual fairness rates. And now, of course, I've suffered a, a, a larger error. Okay, and then there's a bunch of other examples that we've worked out, something that we call subjective individual fairness. Um, and I wish I had time to talk about this because um, there's sort of an interesting kind of elicitation problem here where much like, um, you know, incentive and, in, you know, elicitation um, of utility functions, you're trying to elicitate, elicit um, fairness notions from people. Um, but let me stop there um, and, and take questions. Of course, I can only see Sergio, not the audience. So I see his hand raised. So I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, but maybe, maybe let other people ask first. I don't know. I mean, he's already asked once. So uh, but I, I see the attendees, and there's no question at the moment. So and until we come to that point, uh, feel free to go ahead, Sergio. Okay. So I'm not sure this is a fair question, but let me ask it. Uh, the fact that you are talking about fairness, I'm not talking about justification. I'm not talking about the practice, but theoretically. The fact that you are you are looking at an optimization, convex optimization problem with constraints. The fact that those constraints come from fairness, does it um, does it bring any structure that you can use? Or it, it's just uh, your method essentially works on any such problem, regardless where the constraints are coming from? Um, I guess my answer to that would be the first part of the framework, right, where you um, write down a constrained optimization problem past the Lagrangian and then cast as a two-player game. That part is generic, right? But, but to make that work algorithmically, right, you need to figure out how to essentially, you know, the, so the, where the structure comes in is when we start talking about, okay, this constrained optimization problem involves a labeled data set in which the objective is something like classification error and the fairness constraints are things like the things that I discussed. And then there, then there is real structure because you know, we're exploiting that structure you know, kind of intimately in order to show two things. One, that the best response for both players 
can be cast as just another learning problem. It's just another problem that looks quite similar to standard classification, except you just need to kind of allow these costs and reweightings. So we are definitely using structure there. And then we're also using structure in figuring out which player is going to be no regret and, and arguing that they are, right? And, and sometimes that gets into quite a bit of structure, right? So for instance, in the gerrymandering case, um, you need to kind of end up, you know, using things like Sauer's lemma from BC dimension theory to sort of argue that one of the two players can be made into a no regret, you know, and, and even though there's this common framework, so each of the examples I discussed, you kind of got to go in there and, you know, kind of get into the, in, you know, into the, into the weeds to figure out how to implement all this stuff. Um, and so I, I think we are really kind of taking advantage of the structure in those two parts, those two steps of the program.